in areas where there is very little light so you'll find like cave dwelling spiders or spiders that live under rocks and those areas they're not going to be able to see because well there's no reason to see if it's pitch black there's no need for you to have eyes they'll have other sensory parts of their body so fine hairs that will pick up vibrations and varying other things whereas spiders like this that live out in the open they're going to need eyesight to avoid being killed at every corner so they have to be able to see what's going on around them they won't be able to see far because a spider's eyesight doesn't work like us as people or as monkeys or primates that have binocular vision and are able to see quite far and judge depth very well but they do have lots of eyes which means they can pick up any sort of threat within a close vicinity and then move away from it so the spiders that are blind like I say will be in places where there's very little light and therefore no need to actually see more of a sort of way that they need to be able to actually feel things so you'll find much bigger sensory hairs that they'll have on their bodies that they can then pick up what's going on right it is nice to be out in the sunshine i'm very very happy to be out here it's we just decided we'd get out of the tent for a little bit and just see what's going on around us so far we can't see too much we can hear lots of elephants calling around us lots of impalas that are rutting and so while we kind of look around and see if we can't spot any from here let's go across to jamie who seems to be far more successful in her elephant search I have been very successful in my elephant search. Come on, little one, don't be shy. Out you come. Out you come. <laughs> this little female has been keeping me so entertained. It's been running around, dashing about. It keeps hiding itself behind the trees, though. There's a big female in front of us, probably mum, I would say. But this little one has been so brave this afternoon far away from mummy and then every now and again it looks up realizes mum's quite far and then goes dashing back towards her i did come up this way intent on finding <laughs> what are you doing have you got a little bit of attitude this afternoon hmm? what's going on are you trying to entice somebody to play with you <clears throat> does nobody want to keep you entertained Uh, driving up to Leopard while we watch the interaction of this young one and mum. You want to know what the most intelligent animal is in the bush. You want to suggest it could be elephant. You know what, it's difficult for us to really answer that. Uh, we all have our own personal views on it just based on our interaction with them. I think elephants are very intelligent, yes, I would say that they're very high up there in terms of intelligent creatures. I also think that spotted hyenas are very, very bright. I think that there's a lot of, and that is based on science, both of those thoughts are based on science in terms of the study of elephants' brains and problem-solving tests that have been done with hyenas over the years. Now, though both of those animals are very bright. Personal experience to me suggests that wild dogs can also be quite intelligent, although I've never seen them in a situation where they've had to problem solve. Primates are very intelligent. Baboons and monkeys learn very quickly how to get into and out of rooms and various places like that. And they learn the predictable patterns of people to know when they can go and raid a kitchen, for example. But there's a lot we don't know. How intelligent a giraffe? How on earth do you test how intelligent a giraffe is? There's certain things that we just don't know. And you know there's that famous quote. I've mentioned it a few times when I get asked this question. Um, I've forgotten what the quote is now. The one about... Oh, goodness, you all sent it to me the first time I forgot it. The one about, you know, measuring intelligence based on different skills. Oh, who's this now? Interesting interaction between these females here. Oh, look at little one suckling. Or not. What's happening? Is I think this is affectionate more than anything. Just swaying into the other female that's come to join her where she's feeding. And of course, little one. Oh, they always look so peaceful when they feed like that. So I don't know. I don't think we fully know enough about the animals to judge their intelligence. I, th I just think we know which ones are super intelligent. Like the elephants, the primates, and the hyenas. But beyond that, it's actually really up to you to form your own opinion. 
I know that when I look at an elephant, something looks back at me. Hey, oh, look at its little trunk all tucked up out of the way. Not that I would ever, ever do it, of course. I'm not completely mental, nor indeed suicidal. But whenever I see baby elephants like that, I almost want to go and just give them a kiss on the forehead. They've got such a kissable forehead. Oh, Fraulein Pudelkast, I'm really sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. You want to know what age the babies will start to eat leaves and grass. About six months will be when they start to supplement their milk diet. They start to nibble on and chew on leaves and grass. This little one's older than six months, I would say, or around about six months. And old enough to be nibbling on that, but still reliant on mum's milk. And mum could go on to suckle for another two years, possibly even longer. And it's always entertaining watching quite a large elephant calf having a tantrum when mum doesn't want to feed it or suckle it. But they will start to eat solids at around about six or so months old. Even before that, you might see them putting leaves or grass into their mouths. And that's because a lot of their behavior is learned from observation of their parents. Well, not their parents, their mum and the rest of their family. So they try the whole leaf eating thing and they don't particularly like it. And you'll often see them then spit out the grass or the leaves that they've tried to eat. The same goes for baby rhino as well. I've seen very young baby rhino nibble on grass and then sort of and then spit it out. Must be wonderful being a baby elephant. Everybody looks out for you. Hello big girl. Oh, you're not a girl, you're a boy. That's what was going on. I should have double checked, didn't look properly. It's a male, a young male, but a male nevertheless. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you judge a fish by its ability to climb trees, it will spend its whole life believing that it's stupid. Thank you very much, Janet, for sending that through. That is exactly the quote I was thinking of. You'd think I'd remember it after the first time I tried to use it in a live drive and forgot, but you know, memory like a sieve and all that. Maybe I should take some lessons from these elephants. Oh, speaking of an animal I've just mentioned, it seems as though James has found a giraffe. Let's go and see how intelligent he thinks it is. Uh, this one seems to be very intelligent. It is now considering deeply its existence. You can see that uh, this is probably the Descartes, if you like, of uh, giraffes out here, don't you think? Seb, he looks very philosophical, the Aristotle of giraffes, giving deep consideration to the angle between the tree and his neck, calculating it in his mind, figuring the isosceles triangle formed, not isosceles, the right angle triangle formed by the trunk of the tree, the neck, and then, of course, the invisible line between the top of his horns and the fork of the tree. Now, the reason, of course, I talk like that is much as I always do about intelligence, because, as I always say, every animal is, in, as, is, is as intelligent as it needs to be. A giraffe has absolutely no need to be able to do calculus or speak English. It has a need to be able to communicate infrasonically, reach the leaves and find girls in the case of a bull or find bulls in the case of a, f a female. He's got lots of scars. But, uh... He does lots of scars and lots of uh, paraphilaria, that's what that is. It's a full intelligence which I always think is fa fascinating. Why did we get such a big brain? And of course there are three or four theories about it. 
and if I remember them all correctly, uh, it's got a lot to do with, well, sort of to do with tool making. The more tools we used, the more uh, use we had for a bigger brain. Um, doesn't hold huge water that because there are quite a few animals that use tools and have pretty small brains. But the theory I like best is the theory of our sociality that our enormous brains developed to the size that they did because we are natural manipulators and the better you were at figuring out what the guy next to you was doing and what the ladies around you were doing and ladies what the men around you were doing the better the chances were that you would survive to create offspring and I think that is the most elegant theory as to why our brains got so big. And giraffes just have never had that need. And if you look at increasing brain size in mammals, that's a very nice picture, you will find that the more or the larger an animal's brain, a mammal's brain is, the more sophisticated their social structure seems to be. And so ours is the most complicated social structure. It's unsurprising that we have such very large brains. Rita, you're wondering if lions or hyenas are able to eat giraffes. Yes, they are. They relish them. Lions largely in this area will kill giraffe and normally very big prides. Hyena will seldom take giraffe. But they can. And certainly I would imagine in a place like the Mara they probably do fairly often. But they're very large giraffe, and you know, they're not that common here. They are around, but they're not hugely common. We do see them from time to time, and they come into the area from time to time. But I think that the, buff the, the buffalo, the lions here, tend to have specialized largely on buffalo. So they don't spend a huge time specializing on those giraffe, which of course some prides do. And you will find the prides will um, specialize Riti in various different kinds of prey depending on where they live and what's available. And in Kahuma's case it is buffalo that they go for. Alrighty, we'll carry on. I found no further tracks of the lioness but while I keep looking I believe that Tristan has perhaps got a few little stingless bees to show you. We've got our giraffe skull. So James was talking about a giraffe and little alarm bells went off in my head that maybe we should try and see if we can't find our stingless bee family. Now for those of you who don't know, inside of this beast of a giraffe skull that I have so friendly, well, become so friendly with, is a whole little colony of stingless bees. Now they are on the side. Sorry, Ferg, I placed it the wrong way. There we go. Inside there is where our stingless bees are living and given that it is quite a warm afternoon I wonder if there's not going to be some activities. I'm going to try to get the microscope inside there and see if there aren't any stingless bees buzzing around in there. I know some of you have been wondering about them and whether they are around. Now I'm going to try to get a little bit of sunlight. Let's see. What do you think, Fergus? What's the bets here? Oh, I'm not as good as this as James is. James is very good at hand holding the microscope. Oh look, there we go. We do have a stingless bee. Now hold on, I'm going to try and see if I can't get a little a little bit of a better view. Sorry, it's a little bit blurry for now, but we'll get there, don't worry. But there we go, see its legs? So it's coming out slowly. Like I said, when it's hot like this, you will find that they are a little bit more active. Now where have you gone? I'm trying to just angle it a little bit better. Hopefully our stingless bee will come up again because that was pretty cool. Now I'm just like I say trying to get the focus right, but did you see it there? You can imagine how small that is because it is um, there we go. It's back again Hopefully there we go. Now. I've got it There it is. Look at it. Hello. Welcome to the world Sorry that we are disturbing you but there we go, there's our stingless bees. Now you can see that they're quite small and they'll live inside of this giraffe skull. And they've been in here the whole summer. They've found a perfect place to make a home. They've built their nest coming out of the sort of base of this giraffe skull and inside there will be the perfect sort of nooks and crannies for this particular 
B to survive and there will be a whole host of them in there and like I said when it gets warm like this they're far more active so they'll come out and they'll go and feed around and then they come back into this and they'll spend the night inside here. Yeah. So James Richards you are actually wanting to see the stingless bees well there we go they're out and about and moving around they're actually quite cute every time I've looked for them they haven't been moving around so to actually see one this afternoon has been really cool and look at those jaws can you see them amazing that's so cool I love this microscope this microscope is the most fun thing ever it's like being a kid a bit again you have just able to see all the wonders of nature that you can't normally see oh it's gone away again I think it's a little bit shy so Kurt you're wondering if a stingless bee is the same as a drone well I'm not sure actually I don't really know the answer to that I'm gonna have to try and investigate a little bit like I say James is more the king of the stingless bees because he's been seeing them a lot more every time I try and look at them I can't get them so I'll try and investigate and see if it is indeed the exact same thing I would imagine that it might be but we'll just check it and see like I say I do have access to some insect books while I'm in the tent so we'll definitely try and see if I can't sort that out now unfortunately I've got the focus all wrong again it's my fault I've moved the there we go yeah, that's better now we can actually see you look at the little antenna poking out and I think it's very curious as to what this big thing is around its entrance to its nest with the light shining in now, it's quite difficult because they're moving around so much so I've got to try and kind of change the focus. Now I know what it's like to be a cameraman. You guys do a good job, Ferg. Well done. This is a lot harder than it looks, that's for sure. There's a little leg that's sticking to the side and you can see how those fine hairs work. We were looking at the hairs of the spider and we're saying that it'll help them to traverse their web. And you can actually see how those hairs on the bee are helping to, for it to traverse up the sides of this thing. This little tube that they have. There we go. So stingless bees, you're wondering how they defend themselves. Well, for them, their biggest way of defense is to just get away from a predator. So you'll find, unfortunately, unlike a normal bee that will be able to sting and, and to maim its prey, these guys don't have that option. So they're going to have to try and fly, and that's why they're so skittish. You'll find that they stay inside structures. You'll find them naturally in these skulls. You'll find them in fallen over wood pieces, and they live inside there. And they'll only come out every now and then when they come out to feed. But otherwise, it's inside there and stay hidden as much as possible to stay out of the way of predators. I've got to change the focus again. That's the only problem with the microscope if there's depth of field on it is not very good. I would actually would love to know what the depth of field is on this. But there we go. Look at the big eyes that they've got. So you can imagine how well this insect sees. When you see eyes like that, then you know that they can see very, very well indeed. Right. Now, this giraffe is not a carnivore and the one that I, the stingless bees are living in but it is absolutely eating my legs at this stage because I'm resting on it and the teeth are a lot sharper than they look you would think that a herbivorous animal wouldn't actually hurt one's leg but with the weight of the skull it seems to actually be eating away at my legs itself now the stingless bees have disappeared so I'm going to lift that up but I was just saying now that it, they're busy eating away at my legs and you can actually see why it's because they're a lot more sort of sharp and pointy than one would think they've got these kind of triangular shapes and with the sort of heavy set ossicones that you see on this giraffe this really actually hurts when you rest it on your leg now, I would not want to be a leaf inside those jaws because that would hurt I would imagine being crunched up like that especially when you're being crushed between another set of those and it always in uh, sort of amazes me about getting sort of close up with these teeth is that we think herbivores are always sort of got these flattened grinding teeth but actually there's a lot of triangular sort of indentations that help them just to cut and grind and particularly in the ruminant animals so things like giraffe and, and um, impalas and those animals that regurgitate and have to get the most amount of nutrients out of their food they have these teeth to be able to just cut it up into fine little sections that the stomach can then digest them and get what they need now Ferg I don't know if you can come here because I've noticed something else here which is probably a better job for the microscope but I do want to show you that there are a few little eggs that have been put on these teeth now there is looks like most of them have already hatched but there are two that haven't and I have absolutely no idea what those are for now it's difficult because it's very 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 small as you can see my finger there is not very big but I wonder what those are for it seems like it's been built out of some sort of clay so I wonder if it's not 
a small wasp species or something like that but you can see there's two that haven't hatched and the rest are now empty and have left already but it is a minute insect and it just goes to show you we always think of skulls as being something that represents death but in the case of this giraffe skull we've got those minute egg cases we've got stingless bees living inside here and I'm pretty sure that there are countless spiders inside given that this is spider central and we're in the tent so I would imagine there's lots of those too so it just goes to show that something that's dead is not always the case Ah, so Stacy, you're saying that you assume that ossicones were made of keratin or cartilage. Well, there we go. You can see now that it is all a bone structure. So it is perfect bone material and it is then just covered in actually skin. There's no keratin on an ossicone. And that's why they are born with them as opposed to the buffalo that you find that those will sort of come out and, and the keratin will cover them. These are born with their horns already and as they are born this starts to lift and it fuses around here you can actually see where there's sort of thickening of the bone structure where it's been fused to the skull and then slowly but surely it will grow outwards and what you see with the male giraffe is his fur will kind of come up to this area here and then it stops and that's just skin over the top all right whereas with the female because it's so much narrower as the fur comes up it creates a puffy sort of area on top and that allows for us to see the difference between the male and female Right, I believe Jamie has made her way to the dam and still has some views of those beautiful elephants. So let's go across to her. I couldn't resist making my way to the dam and I absolutely had to show you this view. Because really it's too exquisite. You don't get moments like this every day. The air is filled with dust and it's so still this afternoon that the sun, the setting sun, is breaking through it in the most exquisite way. Just look at this. I could see the dust from about 600 meters away as I was driving up here. And they are having so much fun. And it helps that it's fangs hurt as well, which makes me feel doubly affectionate towards them. <laughs> you missed little one. <laughs> you hit the elephant behind you. <laughs> <laughs> oh look at the baby <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's a good chance that that could be our no it's not I'm mistaken I'm sorry it's not our tiny tiny little baby from Fang's Herd the one that we'd watched fall down all those weeks ago or it could be it's ti I think it's tiny enough it's kind of hard to tell in this particular setting oh that's beautiful I'm just going to sit and let you watch this for a second. This whole place smells like wet mud and elephant and grass and dust in Africa. Oh, it's too stunning. Oh, sorry, Craig, there's Fang coming out now. There's beautiful Fang. I know I didn't describe who she was a moment earlier, but I wanted to just wait for her to come out. That, for our new viewers, is a very easily identifiable elephant. And I don't think it, I need to explain why. Here's her backwards facing tusk. She's definitely one of the biggest in this herd. I suspect, if not the matriarch, very close to being the matriarch of this particular group. Her tusk used to be even longer than that, but it's completely broken off cleanly at the tip. It used to hit her leg as she walked. Having seen the way she was so gentle with that newborn calf a couple of weeks ago, checking that it was okay after its fall I have all the time in the world for that elephant not that I don't for all elephants yes you enjoy a dust bath girl have some fun
We often talk about this sort of thing. George wants to know if the dust throwing behavior is innate or is it learned. I think it's probably a little bit of both. I think that watching baby elephants try to learn to do it the way that they imitate the adults I don't know that it would be all that easy to be able to answer whether or not it's it's something that's completely instinctive or something that the babies pick up from the adults. The way that baby elephants do so much learning when they come into contact with the adults, I'm guessing it's the latter, but I don't actually know. I'm really honestly not sure. I do know that it's something special to watch in a situation like this. It almost, the dust cloud looks like mist. done with considerable more skill from the adults than it is from the little ones. We might have been short on cat sightings recently, but we certainly cannot complain about the elephant sightings. I wonder how much dust they toss up in one trunkful. Now H. Macy chatting about Fang with her backward facing tusk. You want to know if it's a birth defect or an injury when the tusk was growing. Could be either. To be honest with you, it could be a combination of both. It might have been a, a cracked tooth. You know how some people, you just have a natural, when the permanent tooth grows, it doesn't grow all that well. It's got a little bit of a crack or a deadened root. And it might be that she damaged it when she was younger. Or it could just be a birth defect. I, it's hard to know for sure. She's not the only elephant in this particular area that has that problem. Not a, it's actually not even a problem, you know. She's perfectly adapted to dealing with it. But I've seen quite a few elephants with bent tusks in that direction. I've also seen quite a few elephants with two or more tusks growing out of one hole. So that does happen as well when there's some kind of a split or a break in the tusk when it starts to grow. It could be either, I'm not sure. She's probably, I would guess that Fang is over 30 years old, possibly even older, judging by the indents on her, around her temporal region. And she's massive. So she could be even older, she could be even 40 years and older. And one of our viewers apparently saw Fang not so far away from here in Kruger about three weeks ago. Rife from Re Re sorry, Chantel, what was that name? Reef. Reef from Scotland. You want to know whether or not a elephant's trunk could be considered to be a limb. Yes, I Rees, Rees, sorry, Rees. My apologies. Um Reese, you want to know if that could be considered to be a limb, a trunk? Yes, I don't see why not. In fact, I would say there's every reason to consider it a limb. It functions in a very, very crucial way for an elephant. And it is has a huge amount of mobility. I'm not sure what the definition of a limb is. What is the def actual definition of a limb? Does it, does it only include legs, arms and legs? Or legs and legs in the case of an elephant? Or is there another definition to it? To me, I would consider it, it as important as their legs. If you have the answer to what the proper definition of a limb is, you can send it through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. As our elephants disappear off into the dust, I just have to show you something I noticed on the opposite side of the dam, just while they're carrying on like that. Admittedly quite far away, but there's a pair of Nyala ball that bulls that the entire time we've been watching these elephants have been having a serious go at each other. They're right at the back there, Craig, not him. Those two at the back over there. They have locked horns. Young Nala bulls. So this is not a serious fight. This is an almost playful sparring session. Pushing and pulling against each other. 
Now, unfortunately, we're too far away to hear the sound effects, and I, I will try and get a bit closer, but in a moment. But I'm scared if I do, we're going to miss out on the action. But we're too far away to hear the sound of the clash of those horns. And the fence you can see, by the way, is not a fence around the animals for our new viewers. The fence that you notice there is a fence around the camp. It's to keep people in, not animals. <laughs> I wonder if they're looking across to see if the elephants have gone and they can go and have a drink yet. Elephants tend to be quite protective over their water. Oh, obviously not a serious fight, if dinner can prove a distraction. Oh no, hold on, here we go again. No, this is not serious. When you see, when you watch an actual serious Nyala fight, they will run at each other and throw their heads forwards and downwards. And the game, in this case, is to pin your opponent's head to the ground. They're yeah, quite evenly matched. I love the fact that the ox pickers are not bothered at all. They're just carrying on with their day-to-day -day business of cleaning the coat. <laughs> hey, do you guys mind? I'm trying to fight here. Okay, so Texas Brigade, thank you for your definition of a limb. And I guess by your definition, or the definition that you've got for us, I guess the trunk doesn't count as a limb. Because apparently it has to be a paired appendage, such as wings, legs, um, often used for, what was it, for grasping. Did I hear that correctly? I'm going to go with yes. Cool. Perfect. Thanks, Chantal. So I guess then an elephant doesn't elephant trunk doesn't count as a limb. Although I would say in a broad sense, yes it does. It's so important to their day to day existence. And it's got such a range of mobility and it's involved in grasping, it's just not paired. Although now I'm picturing an elephant with two trunks and I really think I need my head red because between the elephant shoes and now a double pair of trunks, I think perhaps I should slow my imagination down one or two steps. Oh, well, they're stuck. Oh, no, they're separated again. Awesome. Well, I'm very glad I came down to the dam. I think it's almost time to start heading to the hyena den. However, Tristan has got something a little bit macabre to show you in the tent. Well, we are trying to convince the male impalas to come close, so I have now dressed up as an impala. I'm not quite the right colour at this stage, and I don't know if the skull is going to work, but we've tied it to my head, and we're trying to get this male impala to notice us, and he's staring in our direction, so maybe, just maybe, they might come closer. Wouldn't it be funny if the male impala come and try to chase me? Well, it would be funny for about a second, until it actually came towards me, because it would be quite terrifying if I had an impala coming running at me. But isn't this... Let's see, he's watching us, definitely. I wonder if he can notice the horns on my head. Come Ferg, let's go a little bit closer and see what he does. This could be quite funny actually. Now these are the ridiculous things that end up happening in the tent. So I'm going to try and head towards my impala, but my horns are slipping which is not ideal. So I'm going to try and hold them up a little bit and see what he does. He's still watching me at this stage. Oh no, I've intimidated him. He's moving away. See, we are intimidating Ferg. We're intimidating fellas. Maybe it's because we're on two feet and not four. Now, I'm going to take this off because it's actually squeezing my head at this stage. Ferg's tied it so well that I think I might actually have popped my brain out and fitted it into the cavity of this Impala male's brain case. Now, when we talk about intelligence and we see the size of this Impala male, we'll realize that it's not, it can't be the most intelligent animal that we have out here. That's its brain, everybody, inside there. It's very, very small. Now, Ferg, you tied it so tight, I think my brain may have pushed into that had I had no sort of skull of my own, because my brain is now feels as though it's throbbing a little bit. But basically, what it is, is this is the male that we see here. Obviously, the female doesn't have the horns, and I was just joking around just to see what they would do. 
and the females all ran away from me actually and the male kind of watched for a while I think he was a bit confused as to all of this because he probably saw the horns and was a bit sort of wondering what is actually going on here but these horns are going to be vitally important for these males during this rutting season we saw earlier Jamie watching them fight and clashing horns and without these they really aren't going to be able to compete at all now a impala with a horn structure like this is going to be right up there for in terms of mating rights he's going to have a good chance of mating because he's got a really well developed set of horns the younger males so the year olds the year and a half two year olds their horns are going to be far too small that they can't get the right leverage in there and be able to then push that other impala away and what you'll find is that the bigger the set of horns the more he's able to get in there and tr try and kind of push that opponent away and the more that that horn will intimidate others even before they start to fight itself now what you will notice is that these horns are very rigid so they've got well not rigid they've got ridges on them sorry my English is going all over the show today but these ridges are vitally important for these impalas when they're rutting without this there is a very very real risk of injury and death if this was very smooth what you would find is when those impalas hit their horns together it would end up in a situation where it would slip and it would go straight into one another and I've actually seen an impala once with a horn sticking out of his belly not a very nice thing but these little ridges will help to sort of hold the other impalas horns so when they lock together this all interlocks and it means that they're actually testing their strength and not trying to stab one another and interestingly enough on this particular impala's horns you can see the scars of where they rut once before look at how worn it is on the inside of all of these ridges so this is all smoothed areas where they have clashed horns and rubbed together and actually smoothed it away really really cool to see right from us being absolute clowns in the tent let's go across to James who's far more serious and far more sort of down to earth on his bumble around the bush I'm feeling very serious at the moment because there is a quite stunning picture of a giant herd of impala walking across the Chitwa clearings here in the dying light of the day and it is just too magic. They're completely at peace, grazing quietly and it's just too stunning. Is that not the most beautiful picture you've seen all day? All reflecting the parotis patents there, the cat's tail grass. Covering everything in a subtle sort of pinkish hue. Hmm. Just gorgeous. The sun is about to touch the horizon, so we've probably got about, as we now know, two and a half to three minutes of sunlight left before it's gone. So shall I just sneak slightly forward? Very slightly. How's that? I am completely mesmerized by this and I was just cursing my luck earlier on saying how Jamie had had all the elephants and I have been hopeless at it but now I don't really care. I think we're having such a beautiful sighting here. This is just beyond speech. And some of them of course are alarm calling. But that's because they're fighting each other. Ooh, we're going to be able to time perfectly now as to when the sun goes down. You can just hear them going <laughs> As I was saying, oh I have said a few times, I'm sure the females are so sick and tired of the noise they're coming this way. You see them there? What, uh, uh, the Impala fighting with each other. Right, have you started your stopwatches, everybody? You've got two and a half minutes before that great orb that fuels all life on Earth disappears 
behind the great Drakensberg Mountains or the Dragon's Back, setting the trees that it passes through ablaze. And Elizabeth, you say, what a beautiful scene with the sunlight behind the Impala. Absolutely a magnificent scene. And one that we are most privileged to witness just about every single day. And I must say, it never, ever gets tiring, old, boring, or even the same. You know, it always just is slightly different every single time. So I hope you got your... You've got your uh, stopwatches going. Mm. B. Wilson, you want to know if I have got a picture? Don't be silly, B. Wilson. You know I'm not allowed to take pictures while we're on drive. Of course I don't. Sorry, I just had a small cough and tickle in my throat there. <clears throat> Not sure what it was. <laughs> and just for your benefit, B. Wilson, I can actually put my camera on silent so I can break the law at will and nobody knows. Are we at two and a half minutes? It feels like it's gone on for longer than two and a half minutes now. But you will notice when Seb eventually zooms out, once that tree in the background has been set fully ablaze by the sun, you will notice how the light has changed so profoundly during that tiny little period that the sun has been disappearing. Mm. Looks like it's coming up. Look at that. Isn't it amazing? All that backlit grass has disappeared. And we now go into the delightful time of the day. The dusk. Which, of course, in this part of the world is very short. There are also, if we go off to the right-hand side, we've got some nyalas walking onto the scene. There they are, the nyalas. Some Nyala use. There we go. Young bull. Still with his mummy. Wondering what life will be like, what life holds for him as a bull Nyala. Wondering if he can take on the mantle of the most beautiful antelope on God's earth. Feeling the tremendous pressure, the you there, not feeling quite the same pressure, but wondering if she will find one day a lovely bull Nyala to be her consort. I'm, of course, talking rubbish. She will definitely find a Nyala bull to be her consort. What's happened there? Sorry, Oops. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that, everybody. Sebastian just wanted to quickly change scenes uh, to the Senegal lap lapwing there. Well done, Seb. That was a very subtle, subtle change there from antelope to bird. Susan, you saw those bats flying by. I think you're talking about those things that were flicking across the sun while it was going down. No, Susan, they weren't bats. They were almost certainly birds. Bats, you will find, fly in a highly irregular way. So they won't flit in one direction from side to side of a picture like this. They will go all over the place. They don't fly to roost, remember. They fly around to try and catch insects normally. And so you will see them flying hither and yon, and any cameraman that is able to follow a bat with his camera is almost certainly going to make you nauseous. Because you will feel deeply seasick. They fly all over the place. So from their flight patterns, I would say almost certainly that those were birds and not bats. Simpala heard is having a wonderful time here. And I guess this is the equivalent on Chitwa of our quarantine clearings. 
everything will come out here for the night time. For as we know, Seb, the night is dark and full of terrors. Well done. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Fergus is the only one who's ever got halfway close to getting that right. He says the night is dark and full of terrapins, which he thinks is absolutely hilarious. <laughs> kind of joke Byron would make. Uh, I think it's so wonderful how the Nyala and Impala have set themselves up sort of together. They have decided that they are not that different from each other and so they are going to stay in amongst each other and increase their security. I suspect quite strongly that it's largely the Nyalas who've decided to spend the time amongst the Impalas because there are so many of them. Now I believe we're going to head across to Tristan in the tent. I have no idea what he's going to show you, what he's going to tell you, or, or anything else about him really, but I'm sure that he will tell you such. Well, James, we are behaving and not doing anything really. We're just touching every single skull that you have inside here and making sure that we have marked our territory as we play around. Well, at least Ferg, he's marked his territory a few times here, haven't you, Ferg? You've been in here a few times lately. Now. Lauren from Illinois, you were wondering about zebra skulls and seeing what they are and what the difference is and why we have this massive gap over here. Well, that gap is not a mystery. The reason for it is because those are two different sets of teeth and so what they need to do is they need to be able to first get the food, which is what these lovely teeth are for. So I'm going to just lift that up a little bit and you can see that they are very, very sharp. So these incisors are able to cut blades of grass and basically pull them into the mouth. That then goes past the palate area and then up onto the molars which are more, far more flattened and that's where all the grinding will do. Now if we look at those molars in comparison to the giraffe, so if we look at the sort of these in comparison to the giraffe, far less sort of triangular sharpness on them, these are far more flattened and it's because the zebra doesn't need to chew its food nearly as much as what the giraffe does. Now the reason for the space between the two is just the sort of dental arrangement. Now as that is cut up from the zebra, so the zebra is going to take a mouthful and cut, if the teeth were already here it would be very difficult for the zebra to be able to chew without actually dropping all the food out of its mouth. So what it's got is it's got a situation where you can cut these here and then the grass that has been cut which will be about that long then travels back with the tongue and will then be chewed there. If these molars were here we'd end up with a situation where these would actually get completely sort of lost and all of it would just end up falling out and it would be very difficult for the zebra to keep its food in its mouth. So once it's cut it allows for some space to then travel backwards and go deep into the mouth of the zebra and swallowed without actually losing it. Now the thing is with the zebra is that they have a very sort of elongated face. Now the interesting part about it is if we want to know a male and female we can actually check just from the skull itself. So normally we would have a situation where it would be tough to tell from a skull whether it was male or female but in a zebra's case we can by looking for canines. Now you may wonder why I say canines but that's because zebras do have canines and the reason why is unlike the buffalo that we looked at or the giraffe with the ossicones or the impala with the horns, zebras don't have anything like that on top and therefore are not able to use that to establish dominance or territory. So what they've got to have is something a little bit different and so the males will have an erupted set of canines, sharp and triangular teeth that will be able to then bite one another to establish dominance. Now this particular one, as you can see, there are no canines. All right, so this is the skull for a female giraffe. There we go, you guessed it. No sharp teeth that are protruding. There would have been sharp teeth over here that would have come out that would have been very big and sharp and would have done a lot of damage to a male zebra. Now, if they did have the canines, it's not uncommon for males to actually go after one another's genitals, which would be a very unfortunate event, and castration can occur. Can you imagine that causing castration? Not a pleasant experience at all, and certainly something that all men would identify with as being something that they would want to avoid in life. Right, 
the sun has set it doesn't seem like there is too much life outside the tent I want to go and have a little look quickly just to see if we don't have any elephants roaming around it's this time of the day that the elephants may have left the water hole and I was hoping some of them might come out and in into this area now be careful there's a pole there Ferg I'm I don't know how you and James do this this is a death trap between spiders and poles and lights it is very difficult to move around but the sun is down there seems to be very little in the way of animals out here it seems quite quiet I was really hoping that we were going to see the yellies coming through and just having a big sort of wave of them coming past the tent this was, would have made James very jealous we can actually hear our impalas they're busy going crazy still they're still kind of on that area that we saw them earlier I'm not going to tie another set of horns to my head and try again but they're on quarantine and that's because of the fact that it's getting dark now as it starts to get dark and dingy so these guys need to start heading out into more open sections so where we are in the tent area is quite dense bush and a perfect place for a predator to start stalking at this time of the day so the impalas then move away from where it's all been shady and cooler now out onto the big open areas so as that they can be a lot more safe right let's see what else we can find Ferg I think now is going to be a little bit late for insects it might be a good time to start looking for a few scorpions I might check underneath the tent and see if I can't find a scorpion or two hidden somewhere in there that we could potentially try and look at in the dark but other than that I think insects are going to be quite tough now but we're definitely going to try and see what else we can find and while we do that let's go across to Jamie and see what her plans are for the rest of the evening I'm going to linger around the hyena dens, what my plans are for the rest of the evening. Nobody's here at the moment, or at least the cubs aren't out at the moment. The adults have obviously not returned. I was hoping that with such a full belly, Ribbon might have decided to return early, feed her cub, and then off she would go again. But the reason I'm hanging out here is I think we still have some mysteries to solve at this particular hyena den. Tristan, of course, had the amazing warning this morning. I could hear them whooping all the way from over there on quarantine which is the open area that clearing we were on and that older cub I'm guessing must be Gwen's I would assume so Gwen of course being one of the lowest ranking hyenas in this clan and we saw these two cubs when they were first out of the den in June last year and they were so so tiny Then they disappeared for eight months and then they came back and Tristan found them on the cheetah cut line den which is a quite a way away from here and then she disappeared again I suspect it must be her that's returned here but we have to wait and we actually have to see the hyenas to figure that out otherwise we've got a mystery cub that's just appeared out of nowhere the one thing that worries me I'm hoping habituation with the adults and those older cubs, those older cubs are terrified of vehicles. They're not comfortable at all with our presence. I'm hoping that the presence of the younger cub that's comfortable with us and the adults that are comfortable with us will convince them otherwise. But I'm worried that fear might be a bit contagious and that the younger cub might pick up on the discomfort of the older cub and get nervous around us as well. I hope not though. I hope it works the other way around. But there's no one here now. So we'll continue on. We'll go look and see whether after their dramatic morning this morning, Hosanna and Shungile haven't arrived back on Juma. Apparently this morning there was something, Tundi, caught, Tundi killed a kudu, and then there was Tamba, and then there was Hosanna and Shungile, and then they all lost it to a Birmingham male lion. I'm talking about leopards for our new viewers. That must have been very confusing. Now I want to go and see whether or not Hosanna and Shungile, especially with Tandi hanging around there, haven't decided to come back here. And then we'll come back again towards the end of the sunset safari with our infrared hopefully set up and we'll be able to determine whether or not that's the case. Okay, where should we go search for young cublets? The southern boundary of Juma, I think. Treehouse Dam and then the southern boundary of Juma. Let's do that. That's where they like to be. I just need to put another jacket on for it's cold. The night is dark and full of icicles. <laughs> you can't do this. Wait. <laughs> Wait till I get on a straighter road, otherwise we're going to crash. <laughs> the steering 
steering boxes in these vehicles are not a hundred percent straight. So we don't necessarily stay on the road unless you make them. Now Zane Sumro, your question about Shongile and Hosanna is a tricky one to answer. You want to know if the Hosanna and Shongile, Karula's two cubs, who are now nearly 16 months old, you want to know if they're together. I don't really know. The information that came in from the sighting this morning was that they were I don't know how much time they've been spending together. I don't think, I think they have been meeting up relatively regularly, but we have find, found Hosanna's tracks and Shungile's tracks separately quite a bit. I honestly don't know if they're, and I don't know if they're together now. They were seen together on Hoffman's, I believe, a couple of days ago. So they are spending some time together. I just don't, I'm not quite sure how much. Ooh, we're going backwards. There we go. That's better. I'm really not sure. Uh, we we see so little of their everyday lives. Such a small percentage of their everyday lives. I'm not sure what whether or not it is the case that they are together often. Obviously, the longer they are, or the older they get, the more time they're going to spend apart and the less frequent their meetings together shall be. I'm not sure. Let's find out perhaps what James thinks. I'm not sure what I think. I think it depends on, entirely on the subject. Uh, for me to tell you what I think about something, I must know in what, what it is that I'm thinking about. It's not impossible for me to just say what I think. Oh, Fosana and Shongile are together. I don't think that they are. I think that they have probably split up again. And, well, we're coming down past this area just on the off chance that they might be here. I don't even want to mention them. I don't want to mention their names. I just want them to be in the road so that I might be surprised by them. Because it seems to me that the harder I look for them, Look for anything, the less likely I am to find it. Okay, the spotlight is out. Any creatures of the night that there are will be spotted by us. I'm not going to give you the list of those creatures again, because if you hear me do that again, I suspect you will probably switch off or roll your head, your eyes, all the way 180 degrees in your head. Do you see any leopards here, Seb? Yeah. Oh, I don't see any either. Let's go up to Twin Dams. I forgot to talk in my very bad Southern America, South Carolina. What a pity, what an opportunity missed. Hey? I'm sure you're all desperately sad that I didn't <laughs> treat you to my bad Southern American accent. Now, even the hippo seems to have absconded from Twin Dams, which is very unkind of him. Oh, there's a heron, also absconding at high speed. Something didn't warn it that I was coming, so it was still here when we got here. All right, let's see down here. Roshni, while we look and see if we can't have a look at that... Oh, now flying away heron. That heron is just, really, it's not very brave. It's the most chicken heron I've ever seen. Roshni, you want to know if Tandi is related to Shongile and Hosanna? She is. She is their sister. She is Karula's first daughter. Well, she and Shadow were littermates together. They were Karula's first offspring and therefore, as Shongile and Hosanna's, dare I say it, her last offspring, uh, well, they are inevitably her sister. 
And it doesn't feel like that, of course, because she's so much older than them, and I, for a long time, referred to her as their aunt, which, of course, they most certainly are not. They are definitely her sister. And brother, of course. She is their sister. My word's completely mixed up this evening. Well, we are, James. We're just trying to check if we can't keep you alive in this tent. As you can see, there is things lurking under the seats and there in the corner. Now I'm going to try and give you a bit more light there, Ferg. Is that a bit better? That is a bit better, that is a bit better isn't it? But there lurking in that white area is a brown recluse spider and not something that you want hanging around your nether regions at all. So James Henry, I'm very glad that you are quite fine and that you have not had an encounter with that. Now the big white structures that you see there are the egg cases. So she's still around, still busy adding to the population and spreading more of them around this area. It's quite frightening actually when you think about it that this is sitting just underneath your backside and nether regions every single day when you sit in this tent and I think all of us from Byron, Taylor, Brent, Jamie and myself and even Steph would be very glad that James made this discovery and found this little predatory spider under our backsides because we've since changed chairs and I did inspect the other chair and it seems that the other chair is just fine. The one that I'm sitting on has no ill-meaning creatures underneath so that's good news. But it does look quite nasty, doesn't it, with those brown legs and black sort of bands on it. Not nearly as pretty as our lynx spider or our jumping spider. This has got this sort of nasty, sinister look to it. Now, I think enough of that spider. It's quite creepy as we go into the night. And as James and Sebastian were talking about, the night time brings terrors. Well, that's a terror on its, all on its own. So I think that chair's got to go outside again. But we'll continue on our sort of discussion about skulls. So... We were talking earlier about the zebra skulls and we've had buffalo and giraffe and I've showed you the sort of dental structures of all of those animals. So I thought it would be quite interesting just to compare now between the antelopes and which are herb herbivorous animals, the omnivores and the carnivores. So what we'll start with is we've seen mostly this afternoon is antelope species. So this is of a little diker and you can see it's still got that similar sort of flattened with little triangles on the edges just to grind up plant material. So that is the perfect kind of shape for a plant eater. It grinds down the food that it needs to be able to survive and so very 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 clever. This particular species you can see unlike the zebra does not have the teeth at the front. These guys will chew off the side and that's because they're not grazers. They're eating more off trees themselves and so they're able to use the sort of side of the mouth to break what they need. Now the omnivores, which we have over here. Now this is a baboon. There we go. Hello baboon. Very nice. Now you can see the baboon's dental shape is completely different. It has very similar incisors to what we saw on the zebra. So it's got those incisors that are able to cut vegetation. And that's because the baboons will go after vegetation every now and then. They will eat certain herbaceous plants as well as fruits and varying other things. So when they eat things like marulas, this helps just to break the peel off and to be able to then get to the fruit on the inside. So those are vitally important for sort of breaking and tearing and making sure that they can get to plant material. Then behind them, you can see a very, very impressive set of canines. So those canines, some of the biggest canines in the world in relation to the size of their head, massive, massive canines. And that's because baboons do eat meat. So after all of this nonsense with the rutting and male impalas chasing each other around, there will be little babies running around at the end of the year. And once those babies come out, these guys are very, very bad at hunting them. They come and they follow the herds around and all throughout the year they kind of make friends with the impalas and get the trust. And then once the lambs are born, they'll often snatch those lambs as they're born before they're able to move. So they're quite naughty with that. And that then is to be able to kill any sort of meat um, or any sort of prey animal. Then behind that, you can see we go into the most Molars. Now the molars are slightly different to what we see on the other herbivorous animals. They have a lot more sort of angular shapes to them. You see here there's a lot more sort of edging to them and that's so that they can both chew down food that is plant-based, so fruits and varying other things, but also that they can cut up meat if they do eat meat. So that will be able to cut those chunks of meat up and crush them down that they can swallow them and not have to swallow too big a chunk. So a very different structure. They've almost got a bit of everybody's inside there and that's because they need it to feed off all the different things that they do. Now if we go to the leopard and we've got a leopard right here, you can see the leopard already is vastly different to what you see on 
the baboon. The leopard has got massive canines, big triangular teeth on the side that it will use as a basically a set of scissors to shear big chunks of meat off. So, David, you're wondering what the biggest canines are in the Kruger. Well, in terms of canines, in size would be if you just took the canine tooth on its own, it would definitely be lions. Lions have big, bulky canines. Um, but in terms of relation to the size of the head, you'll find that actually the baboons have the largest canines. So you see these are quite sort of big and bulky, but the baboons have length, which is what some of the carnivores don't have. I'll turn that a bit for you folks, so you've got a bit more light. But there you go, you can see these are quite long even in a leopard. Now this particular skull, it doesn't fit together quite as well as it would. As you can see, it all comes apart. Don't worry, it was like that before. James won't shout at me, so let's put those down. Um, but these wouldn't have lapped down as far as what we saw there. They would have kind of come down about halfway, but not as long as the baboons by any stretch of the imagination, even though the leopard is a bigger creature. So lions would be the biggest single tooth, but the, the baboons often have longer teeth longer canines than what the lions even do which is quite amazing now you can also see that the incisors here now these would be used on a sort of predator level not for actually grabbing meat what that is for is more for plucking so you'll find when a predator grabs something like an impala and this leopard wants to eat it it's got lots of fur and so it uses those teeth to actually pluck off all the fur and the reason why is because fur is very very difficult to digest we were talking earlier about the keratin on the buffalo sort of horn set and that only the moths are able to eat that and so those teeth help to get rid of that fur so that the leopard actually doesn't have to have too much fur in its stomach and take up too much space instead of having meat in there which is very very cool so it just shows you how important these dental structures are for all of these animals in order to survive now we've spoken about giraffe we saw that it had stingless bees in its head now i believe jamie has a giraffe in infrared I do indeed, and what a fantastic expansion of our world the infrared light has given us. You've spoken about skulls with Tristan. He has an animal with a very peculiar skull. Very large and very long, and of course in Tristan's tent, home to the stingless bees that James loves so very much, and is so very fond of. The interesting thing is to see the reflection of the infrared light. And yet all that animal is seeing, just like I'm seeing if I turn back and look at it, is just a gentle red glow. So it doesn't bother them in the slightest. And it allows us to sit with the diurnal animals long after we would have had to just basically drive right on past them in months gone by. Oh, shame. I think she stepped on a thorn there. Or she stepped on a stump or something. She had something that caused her to misstep. Wonderful. You can actually see so much detail. Her eyelashes. Oh, no, now you can't. Now all you can see is a bright terminalia. Hey, how's that? The night is dark and full of terminalia. Doesn't have quite the same ring to it, does it? Hold on, let's see if we can catch up. Unfortunately, they are moving off quite rapidly. Huh, James has had the same idea that I have. I can see his incredibly bright lights approaching in, a, in the distance. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> okay. Hmm. Our giraffe have sort of disappeared. Let's try going backwards. I can hear the voices of people at Treehouse Dam, which means that somebody's having a, a brief stop for a little sundowner, so I'm not going to go and interrupt them. There's our giraffe, but she's quite far away now. Can you see her there, Craig? Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. That's better. And there's actually about four of them around us. I can only see the one at the moment but hopefully they'll stick around for the sunrise safari as well so we can spend a bit more time with them because I think this female's going to vanish off shortly we should be quite patient now though I think giraffe have the most beautiful tails, don't you? they don't look ridiculous in the way of a lot of tails of the larger animals 
It is a little bit difficult to see though at this distance in infrared. And they will continue to feed as it starts to get dark and then at some point they'll settle down and lie down for a little bit rest for a little bit but they don't sleep much like elephants they don't sleep for particularly prolonged periods of time and of course the fact that they lie down does also make them quite potentially at risk of attack Now, Chris Rogue, you want to know if any animals or reptiles can see in infrared. I'm pretty sure that a lot of insects can see in infrared in the infrared spectrum. I know they can see in ultraviolet. I'm not sure about infrared. I don't think any of the mammals do. Um, I'm not sure about birds, actually, come to think of it. Somehow I doubt it. But I'm not 100% sure, to be completely honest with you. I don't think any of our mammals can. But I'm not, I'm not certain. I'm cert I imagine that there's insects that can, but I'm not certain about our mammal species. There goes our giraffe. She's vanished off. Time for us to continue searching for any animals. Now, Elizabeth, you want to know <coughs> how well giraffe can see at night. Well enough, better than we can. They can see most, almost all of the animals can see better than we can at night, but not as well as something like a lion or a leopard or a hyena, an animal that is nocturnal. So one of the big reasons why we don't use spotlights or any kind of lights on the animals, the diurnal animals, is because it actually dazzles them. They're not equipped to cope with it. But for something like a lion or a leopard or a genet or a civet, anything that's nocturnal, the reflective layer at the back of their eyes that giraffe do have, called the tapetum lucidum, it's far more functional in the nocturnal cats or the nocturnal animals. And it bounces that light, light back so efficiently that the light doesn't dazzle them. But it does dazzle the diurnal animals, which is why we don't spotlight them because that ultimately can put them at risk of attack by predators because it'll take them quite a while for them to regain their night vision. It's like if I turned around now and shone the spotlight straight in Craig's face, he wouldn't be very happy with me at all. In fact, I might be in serious trouble and he wouldn't be very good at filming because he wouldn't be able to see. Have a look at some documentaries. I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail. Hello, Elise. I'm not going to go into detail as to which documentaries. But have a look at certain documentaries. If you see some kind of a kill, a lion kill or a leopard kill, look and see if they're using electric light. Look and see if that antelope looks dazzled or whatever it happens to be. Because if it has, there's a possibility that there's some unethical filmmaking going on there. And no matter how exciting, well, it's not always exciting, but potentially exciting seeing a kill may be, there's never an excuse for us intervening in that way and making it easier for the predator or more difficult for the prey. And it does happen in unscrupulous situations. Okay, well I guess it's destined to be an elephant-themed evening. I suppose, start as you mean to finish or finish as you started or something like that. Justine, welcome to our, well, not welcome, I hope you've been enjoying our sunset safari. Justine, you want to know if elephants sleep standing up? Yes, they do. Um, they actually frequently will doze standing up. The babies lie down more frequently than the adults. The adults can lie down, but they generally don't. And they often rest their heads up against trees or rest their bodies up against termite mounds. But there is a fallacy that grown, fully grown elephants can't lie down. They can. They absolutely can. I've seen them do it before. But they don't do it for long periods of time. And bear in mind that elephants actually don't sleep all that often, adult elephants. There's a study, a, a very comprehensive study conducted into the sleep patterns of elephants. And generally it seemed as though the adult females only entered into proper deep sleep about once every two or three days. The rest of the time they just kind of doze. 
I have walked into several elephants that have been completely, completely fast asleep. It's seriously quite surprising because of course they go totally still so you don't hear them and you can actually find yourself taken by surprise when you're on foot when all of a sudden because you're not making too much noise and there's no vehicle noise to alert them hey look at that we're looking right into your mouth <coughs> I've had a, one or two moments like that where I found an elephant fast asleep This place is just teeming with elephants. Let me shift slightly. This isn't the most fantastic of views. And as it starts to get completely dark, then I'll probably move away. Just because it's quite difficult in infrared with this number of animals to keep track of where they all are. So I can't behave in the way that I might normally when I can see the elephants. Like now for example there's a big female coming out in front of us and I don't want to end up blocking her I can just see her now in the dim light but in total darkness I could easily have got in her way Johnny no elephants can't jump it would put too much in the way of impact on their bones adult elephants cannot jump they are however very agile creatures they can climb up certain things, um, they don't naturally jump, but they can climb over obstacles, they are surprisingly agile. And essentially what I keep reminding myself is anywhere that a human being can go on two feet, so without actually actively climbing using our arms as well, an elephant can go as well. And I found elephant dung in the most bizarre of places, right up on the top of what we call in South Africa copies which are essentially kind of rocky hills or hills made up essentially of rocks and I've managed to find, well I have in the past found elephant dung up there so they are very very agile creatures and watching them climb up and down the ju up and dam, up and down the Juma Dam wall is quite a clear indication of that and I want to shift forward yet there's another young elephant that's coming out slowly but surely and I don't want to give it any kind of a fright or block it from its mum in the dark. I've even seen an elephant climb a tree before. That sounds ridiculous and I should probably qualify that by saying it was a fallen over tree. It was a big fallen pushed over marula and it was it managed to get all four feet off the ground at one point but most of the time it was resting three feet on the ground and oh, sorry three feet on the tree and one on the ground here comes the young one, catching up with mum. There we go, they've all, they've all met up in front, Craig. There we go, there's a the little one. I'm just trying to listen to make sure that there's none off to the left of me so that I don't end up putting myself in their way. And there are more to the left of me, I can hear them chewing quite contentedly. So I'll shift forward a little bit but not too much further. I miss the days of having the lions around all the time. When we, not that I'm complaining about having elephants at all, but just we had so many wonderful moments with them in infrared. I miss those moments with the lions. I wish the Inkuhumas would come back to us. Well, there's a fantastic view of a bottom. And that, I'm afraid, is the best I can do. For now. Right, our elephants are quite well hidden, but it sounds like James has found a feathered bird of the evening. As opposed to what? A bald bird. A feathered bird of the evening as opposed to an unfeathered bird? 
uh, perhaps a plucked chicken in the road. No, I have found indeed a feathered bird, and I'm going to make its call for you because I think it is so very funny. It goes like this. Ah, 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 ah. That is the bronze-winged courser. Now I will play its call properly for you. It's so rhythmic. <laughs> it's now deeply confused. So, would you like to have a go at the bronze-winged courser's call? No thanks. Fair enough. I don't want to sound like a donkey. You don't want to sound like a donkey. <laughs> yes, I think that's fair enough. Now we have had a vast number of bronze winged courses this year. Why, I am not sure. I'm just going to read a little bit about their breeding. Yes, they breed on the ground, they're monogamous. Ah, oh, here we go, here's quite interesting. Little known nocturnal species, blah, blah, blah. Influx of bird in November that north, go, departs northwards again in May, June. So they are apparently, perhaps, not quite as a... Uh, well, no, there's... I see, OK. So they go up into Zimbabwe and Mozambique for the winter time, which is hardly a long... Um, it's hardly a long migration. It is off, off, obviously they do do a sort of localised migration, but why there have been so many this year I just cannot understand. And although they are monogamous, it says, they are solitary in their habits. So I, I mean, maybe a key to a good marriage, yes you meet up, yes you are faithful and monogamous, but you also have your loan time. Let us learn from the <laughs> bronze winged corsair. Of course I have no place giving advice on this, because I of course am not married. Seb, what do you say? Time apart, if you say? You don't want to answer this, do you? No, you just... Is your wife watching the show or not? Yes, exactly, good point. Is your wife watching the show or not? There you go. <laughs> All right, I think Tristan is now, in fact, I'll tell you exactly what I hope Tristan is doing. We're going to go across to him, but I hope very much that when you get to him, and I'm just preparing him for this because he'll be listening to what I'm saying, I hope that the broom is out and that he is sweeping thoroughly, and I also hope that the feather duster is in his hand and he is uh, just polishing off one or two things, and I also hope that he feels very bad for breaking the leopard jaw. And if you, you can tell him, that uh, it was, in fact, me who broke the leopard jaw. Well, yes, James, we've got to do a bit of housekeeping. We know that we have to leave the tent in good condition, and otherwise we are going to be in lots and lots of trouble with James if we do not. So I'm going to put the feather duster down because now it's time to not use things. We'll do this all a little bit later, and Ferg, you definitely will be helping me because otherwise James is going to shout at us. And luckily, I knew about the leopard skull already. I knew that the leopard skull was broken because I did it the other day, and it all fell apart in James's company, so that's why I didn't feel too bad. But we've discussed teeth ad nauseum this afternoon. We've talked about herbivores and omnivores and carnivores. But what we haven't talked about when it comes to teeth is for defense and establishing a dominance. Now, my radio has just unclipped and fallen off. So hold on, Ferg, I need to just sort that out. Otherwise, I'm going to be pulled backwards by my head because my things are all attached to the radio. So let's just clip that back on because otherwise it's going to be an uncomfortable next few minutes. But like I was saying, we haven't discussed what this is. Now, most of the animals, like we say, have horns of some structure that they will use to fight with one another and defend one another and try and sort of use it to be able to establish dominance as well as to defend themselves from predators. But some of the animals out here don't have that option. So things like warthogs, hippos, zebras have got, and elephants to a degree, have got no sort of horn structure at all to defend themselves. But what they do have is they've got tusks, which as we know are modified teeth. Now this is a warthog tusk that I am holding at the moment and you can see it's got that big curve and it is actually essentially the exact same thing as an elephant tusk, just in a miniature version. It's interesting though that Warthog tusks and hippo ivory, 
well, warthog ivory too, don't actually have as much value as what elephant ivory does. It always astounds me. But the interesting thing about this particular warthog tusk that I was quite sort of sort of interested in was that inside here, now I don't know if you can see it, Ferg, because it's going to be quite difficult for you to see it, but inside there, there is a little white structure, and I wasn't 100% sure what it would be. It's a bit difficult because there's not very much light, but I'm going to show you in the microscope what I'm talking about. But I, let me try and set this up quickly. Now, it is there somewhere. Hold on. The microscope does give me... Uh, there we go. Hold on. So I'm just trying to find it that I can actually see. There we go. Now, there is a white structure in there. And what it actually is... There we go. You see it? On the right-hand side. Now, interestingly enough, the only thing that I can think of is that is the root of this particular tooth that has then dried out. So, there you can see that indeed it is actually a tooth itself. Now, there we go. So, I'm just trying to find the focus of the end of it. But it seems that the tooth root has sort of mummified to it essentially and hasn't rotted away and that it is still attached to the tooth itself. Isn't that amazing? Not every day you're going to actually see the roots of a teeth still attached to it and it's because the root structure in these teeth are so so long to allow it to be able to stay in the actual skull itself so you can imagine when you've got elephant tusks or these warthog tusks most of the tooth is exposed but it has to have a massive long root to be able to stay inside the skull itself so really cool to see that's not something you're going to see every single day right enough playing with teeth now I think Ferg I'm sure we're going to need to get back to making sure that we clean everything up and let's put this back before James shouts at me now where was it Ferg do you remember Ferg you don't remember I don't remember either let's put it there and just not tell James Shh, everybody he'll not know the difference I'm sure right we're going to sort of see what else we can do in terms of cleaning and try and get James's tent spick and span and keep all the spiders out and while we do that let's go across to Jamie and see how she's faring with her elephants Uh, no, not Jamie. James with a uh, chameleon. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, there is the chameleon. And it's quite unusual to find a chameleon at this time of the year. They've normally sort of gone away by now into their Eastervated state somewhere around the place. I seem to remember the beginning of my guiding career, though, seeing them more frequently sort of around this time of year, going into the mid of winter, middle of winter, and seeing them only infrequently until really quite deep into the summer. That's quite nicely hidden, isn't it, Seb? We're geniuses, aren't we? Complete geniuses. We almost lost it, by the way. It was luminous when we first saw it, of course, but then it turns the same colour as the tree that it's on. And um, I pulled the spotlight off it and Seb turned the camera off and then we couldn't find it anymore, but thankfully... Uh, our great genius prevailed, and we managed to we managed to keep up with it. Let us head on our way. That is the flap-necked chameleon, obviously, unless you're a new viewer, in which case it wouldn't be obvious at all. So I shall tell you, it's a flap-necked chameleon. Maybe we'll find another one, and I'll slow and easy amble home for two minutes Tristan two minutes to find all of the things that we set out to the royal family of leopards elephants the lioness whose tracks we found oh that's very interesting Stacy yeah I think this answer is going to be the same for everybody you say is there an animal that has frustrated me more than any other why well, you know in terms of looking for it yes a uh, leopard definitely leopards are the most difficult things to track if they don't want to be seen it is just simply impossible to see them and you need a tremendous amount of skill to actually follow them track for track I do not possess that skill and so I have been most frustrated looking for leopards, especially when I was a young guide trying to teach or trying to show guests leopards. It was tremendously frustrating because everybody got so excited about seeing them. So I must confess that leopard has definitely by far and away frustrated me the most. And the only reason of course that they are difficult to find is that they're so secretive. 
Right, we're on to quarantine clearings. We've got a couple of impala up ahead. I think we'll leave them be as we come to the stage of the evening where we must bid you a fond farewell. Thank you very much for coming on our drive. Thank you, Seb, for your supreme effort today and putting up with me, my incompetence in the wilderness. I'll try and do better tomorrow, I promise. Um, I hope that you all have a wonderful evening or morning wherever you happen to be in the world. We will see you tomorrow at 0630. Bye-bye.